I'm going to try this one, maybe get better video. All right, so back to the thing. Somebody told me, hey, you didn't put an announcement for the homework and, or for the essay part, right? So I was kind of like, oh, my bad. I did remind you in class, though. And then, uh, so normally in college, it's kind of like you guys are a little bit on your own. And sometimes it'll be as long as it's on the syllabus, then it's not, I, I, I won't, like the other professor might say, I don't have to tell you anything. You know what I mean? Like, I already warned you. But then I realized I hated the way the syllabus was set up or the schedule. So I want you guys to take a picture of this next part or make a note of it, right? So what's gonna happen now is this week in purple, at least we're gonna have homework that Friday. So this weekend we're gonna have homework. Next, the next two weeks we're gonna have in class assignments. And then that, after that break, we're gonna have one more homework. I'm thinking of, I have an extra homework that was from the last material. I'm kind of thinking of not doing it because you guys already took the midterm and got an A. So I'm like, what's, you know, if I go back to old material, it's not gonna help you. So I'm gonna save that homework somewhere in here. Well, I'm going to make an extra homework, but I'll make sure I make you guys aware of it. Hey, there's an extra homework, homework, and the goal is I'll drop the lowest out of all the ones you have. If I get to the end and we don't need it, I'll just make an extra one covered, like a general thing for the review, like a little review right before. Again, if you score good, I'll put it as your score. If you score bad, I'll just drop it. If you don't do it, I'll let it go. Yeah. All right. So make a picture of this. If you guys put it on your phone, that's one. And talking about that, super exciting stuff. I've had the first person come ask me for a letter of rent. I was like, yes, it feels good. Um, so that's where I was kind of like reminding you guys that there's stuff that you have to do that I won't tell you that you have to do, but you should start looking into it. So um, the student was looking for a letter of rent for an internship for the summer. Like those things aren't due for like another like two, three months. And she already came up to ask me for it. So I was super excited. I'm like, woo, we get to write one in there. Um, I've done them before for grad school. And I've done them for um, med school stuff. Normally, this is a med school one. I really enjoy this one because it has, um, like it gives you a good guide of the things to cover. So, here it kind of tell I'll share this with I'll put it on my, um, on the part of the, this week's assignments. Um, so one of the things that they tell us is kind of how they want us to, to like, like how do you know this person, right? So it'll be like personally, how much time you spend with them, like, like how did you meet them, how have you worked together, and what can you say about this person, right? So for that, some of you I feel comfortable enough to make. I feel like I can make good comments for you, right? Like first midterm, I remember I think it was Morgan and Ecclesiano. When you guys answer that second question, I'm like. There, there's a question here. It talks about like science inquiry or what is it? Like it's basically applying science to try to problem solve. And I'm like, if they asked me that, I would put that for you two guys. And it would like look super cool. Like, oh, I can see that they try challenging themselves, right? Um, there's other students, I think it was Cody, right? Who did the, the DNA sequencing one, right? Where I was trying to get that random puzzle and then you guys like kept battling. You did it too, right? Yeah. So I have a few notes on my Excel sheet, kind of how there's things that from this sheet, if you came to ask me, I'd already feel comfortable talking about that for you. Um, the unfortunate side to that too is that there's some of you on the sheet where I'm not sure if I can make a really strong case for you yet, right? So I know going forward, you're gonna need your recommendations. It, it, like I really enjoy writing them for people and just to be like, hey, it's great, great, great kids, great people. Um, but some of you guys haven't had the chance to interact, right? And uh, that's on my part too, but. I want you guys to feel that office hours is also a place for me to get to know you and for you to kind of share a little bit about yourself. Um, even if you don't do it with me, you have all the professors this quarter. Look at this sheet and look at the things that basically they're going to be asked to write about, about you. And when you go to meet them and talk to them in person, make sure that you kind of like showcase these attributes of yourselves, right? Like some of them, they talk about volunteering. Yeah, I think it's the ethical responsibility um, or uh, service oriented. So if you do volunteer or do anything on the side, like as of right now, I don't know if any of, the, of any of that about you guys, but if you guys go to office hours, talk to me, talk to another professor, and make sure you, you, you share that with them. It makes them have a better letter or a better, you know, a more, uh, gives them more of a whole story about you. So take a look at this. You guys still have like two more months of, if you haven't met your professors yet, go 
reach out to them. Go to office hours, literally introduce yourself, say hi. Um, if you're kind of, if you don't know what to talk about, normally you just ask them about what they do, about their projects, and then you won't get them to be quiet, you know? Like, uh, I had a few people already tell me that, oh, dude, I gotta go, and I'm like, oh, sorry, man, you know, I get chatty. So it's all right, um, but I say, please reach out, go talk to professors, um, start locking in some of those letters of rec. For our school, before they always talked about like the hardest class for us was biochemistry. That's where a lot of people they, they were like, hit that class and it was super hard. So everyone wanted like, hey, we want the letter from that guy, right? Like the biochemistry professor, that's the hardest letter. But as of now, right, and like if you need my letter to help you with anything, do this stuff over the summer, reach out to me, um, read this, and like I said, come talk to me, showcase those features about that. All right. That way uh, I feel more comfortable about writing stuff for you guys. So I'll put that up there, no pressure, but it could be fun. You guys are really doing really good in bio. Like I'm super happy. Um, I'm really enjoying teaching the course with you guys. So um, I, I, I don't know what you guys' plans are. Like, I don't know what you guys' career choices, what you guys are interested in, but there's a lot of programs that you can do research over the summer. Like uh, in my old school, they would basically accept like 30, 40 students. They would be working like full-time over the summer They'd be getting paid like it was a job, but they actually got to do research in a lab. I think it was like two or three students from that visiting program ended up either getting positions at our school or another UC for graduate school, right? So it's like throwing those connections. I don't have that many out here, like um, go to neighboring schools, go back home. If you guys are waiting to travel to California for the summer, I highly suggest it. Uh, then, um, I can see if I can look up some of those programs for you. And I'll probably put it in a review session for this session. I'll find some of those links, throw them up there. And if you're interested, throw them up there. If you yourself find some good links or some good programs, I'd appreciate it. Throw it in there. We'll make a big list of things that you guys can do over the summer. Yeah? All right. So science. I think for this summer, I'm going to try doing research in my lab, too. I have a few students, and I'm, I'm going to put the application for hopefully like four or five to work with me over the summer. I hope my students stay with me, but if they get an internship program at another school, go. You know, I say I'll be like, go, go do your thing. Um, but if that's the case, I'll leave it open for, for other students. Yeah. So cool. We got science, we got the letters of rec, and we got summer projects. All right, now back to the science stuff. All right, so here we're going to keep talking about membranes. And right now we're going to be, last week we talked about how the membrane, because of its two, the fossil and binary, right? It basically has like three regions that have different properties. In some of those regions, you have the hydro, hydrophilic part on the outside, which is going to be your water loving side on the inside, on the outside. On the middle, you have this hydrophobic core. And so when you're trying to get more, more, uh, molecules through that, you're gonna find it quite challenging, right? Because you're gonna to need to be able to interact with hydrophobic and hydrophilic molecules. And that's basically what we're gonna be talking about today, about how to get molecules across. So again, this is gonna be a good chart. Um, please feel comfortable with it. Basically on this side, you know the different categories of the molecules that we're gonna be working with. And the other one is about how permeable they are to this membrane itself. The most things, the things that are travel through the fastest or the easiest are going to be things that are small, especially like O2. And the other emphasis is going to be that they're non-polar. Your CO2 and nitrogen are basically going to be able to diffuse right through that membrane. We go to the opposite side of that. Here, even though they're still small, the problem is they're ions. So if they carry a charge, they're going to have a really hard time trying to get through that hydrophobic core. Right? And you can see things in between, right? They're going to have issues with polarity or you have issues with size. Kind of like sugar and water. Now, how do we get to that membrane? <clears throat> this is a video from the text, and you guys get a chance to make sure you guys are looking at these videos. But for now, you're going to hear my, my side of the story. Right? All right, so today we're going to be talking about if you can't go right through the membrane itself, right, directly through it, you're going to have some kind of way to adjust yourself or adjust the molecule or adjust the properties to be able to travel through that. And here we're going to find really helpful things where we're going to look at these transmembrane proteins that they kind of go through this membrane through both sides. Kind of like what we talked about last week was that they basically have 
uh, special properties that allow them to interact with the hydrophobic core, and the, but still produce an internal channel that allows us to interact with our molecules. So for this, we're talking about transport. And the big ones we're going to be talking about is going to be the transport of hydrophilic molecules. And later on, again, we're going to be talking about transport of ions. This is charged ions. So for this, we're going to get into, into the transport. Yeah, we're going to be talking about three different types. Here I'm showing the first two, which is your channel proteins. The channel proteins, in this case, they actually make like a port. I want you to think of it almost like a straw. It means that the molecule is able to travel both forward and backwards. And when these molecules are moving, uh, the protein keeps its shape. Opposite to that, we have these things called these carrier proteins. And the difference between the carrier proteins is that when they interact with the molecule, they actually change, they have a conformational change. That means that the structure of the protein actually shifts between cycles. So as you can see this from here, basically in the open state, it's going to pick up a molecule, it'll interact with the core. Afterwards, it goes to a conformation change. The protein will open at the opposite side, and now it can release the molecule. That's perfect. All right, here's my beautiful picture. And you can see this is actually a channel, and you see the protein going through it. But let's get into this guy. So, first, we're going to start off talking about passive transport. Or, first, we're going to talk about diffusion, and it's going to get us into transport. All right, so diffusion, we're talking about, I want you to think about uh, water itself, right? And there's going to be a medium that's traveling through it, right? Um, for today, just to keep it simple, because I'm going to keep talking about it, I'm going to talk about my favorites, one of which is sodium. Right? Which is going to be NA plus. And then for shorthand, when you guys see my notes, you're going to see something that looks like this. So if I put an up arrow or down arrow, I just mean it has high concentration or low concentration. I'm using these brackets to represent to simplify or to, uh, to represent how much the concentration of the molecule and then. So basically here I'd be saying, if I do a little drawing, you see this, it's sending this to a high amount of sodium ion, right? If I do something like this, you have low concentration of your potassium ion. I'll be talking a lot about these two molecules and about the person that move them. So I'm giving you the, the key now because I'm going to talk about a lot more. As so, when I want you to think about what's going on here for diffusion, you imagine uh, the black background would basically just be like water, right? Just what's in the environment. And then I want you to think about it in red about basically these little independent ions. What they'll do is they'll basically they normally move from a place of high concentration. To a place of low concentration of themselves. So if have, we started off with a pool like this, and this was like full of water, and here you dropped off a droplet, which was your high and a concentration. Right? You see a bunch of the little red dots down here. They normally are able to interact with each other, and they bounce off each other. What's going to happen there is, in places where you have your high concentration, they'll bump into each other so much. They'll start to move that way because if a molecule has a chance of bouncing this way versus bouncing that way, when it moves towards the lower concentration, it's less likely to bump into itself. Right? So it's more likely that it keeps going forward. If a molecule goes this way, there's more molecules on this side, it can bounce back into itself or it gets on tight and it push itself forward. So if it moves that way, it keeps going. If it tries going backwards, there's a chance it'll bounce into itself and it'll keep itself going forward. As it's doing this, you're going to have these molecules basically move to the eventually, kind of like the end of the simulation. You see they're bumping into each other. But you should reach a point where they're kind of evenly distributed across that area. So at first, you're thinking about diffusion. This is going to give us, after I drop my droplet, we'll have net movement going back. Right? These molecules will start diffusing, and they go this way. Once we have the molecules evenly spread, then the chances of bumping into different neighbors when it's completely even, it'll become zero. So you won't have net movement anymore. It'll still be moving, but there won't be a flow. Right. So diffusion is right before that balance or that equilibrium is reached. Here's a really cool example. 
So again, you have water. Here, what they're doing is, I believe it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dye. They place it at the bottom. And as you can see, imagine there's a high amount of particles here. They start bouncing with each other because there's more here than above. When they bounce with each other, if they try to go down, they can bump into themselves, it'll push them the other way. So if they go to a place of lower concentration, it'll be easier for them to diffuse. And eventually, you get to, to the state of the way at the right, which is your reach equilibrium. And you won't have a net flow, but it'll still be diffusing within that area. So that's part of this pathway of diffusion. Um, it's going to be about when we have these things called uh, semi permeable membranes. Oh, sorry, these are so these are fully permeable membranes, or it's just a hole. They can both travel both ways. And here, I believe they're looking at two different particles. You can either say that your Na is here and, and this is your, your potassium. And because they able to flow back and forth, even when we start them off on each side at diffusion or the, the interaction between the molecules, we mean that it'll drive each one towards the other side. <clears throat> so even if we started with similar concentrations of potassium here and sodium here, the fact that we both have positive charge, it's not going to be like, oh, there's enough molecules here, here where there won't be any diffusion. They still will be able to diffuse this way, while these particles will diffuse that way. Right. So it's more like ion specific. It's not a concentration of the Sol, uh, sol, uh, solute specific, yeah. All right, so they're going to be moving from this state of where they're highly enriched in a specific area to they eventually diffuse all, all, all within that area. Just like you can think about it with two different particles, um, you can also think about it if there was only one single particle here, the purple one would basically diffuse towards the right. We thought about the white one as a single particle, it would be on the right and it would diffuse by itself, it would try to take, move over to the left till it's completely even. And this is kind of like I was saying before. Um, there we go, this is the one I want. So in the cases where you have high concentrations in one side versus low concentration in the other one, again, in my head, I'm thinking about these little interactions that's going on because you have a higher concentration here, there's a bigger chance that they'll bounce into each other. That means that any movement of the, of the of the ions going this way has a chance that it's going to get pushed back. While these that are moving towards a lower concentration, they still have chances of interacting, but they're a lot lower. So that means that that net interaction means that those molecules are basically going to bounce into a place of lower concentration. So if you're going from a two molar concentration to a molar concentration, you have net you have movement both in and out of side one, but the net flow of ions will be towards uh, side number two. Now, here, the whole time I was focused on the ions, which would be like my favorite salt, sodium and potassium. Now, if instead of that, now we have this thing here, which is going to be our semi permeable membrane, right? That's a big one, write it down, make sure you guys feel comfortable with it. And what that does is it basically makes a little bit of a seal. And what we're going to keep track of now is going to be water movement, not the movement on the ions. Yeah. So before we were seeing the ions was coming, was moving from one side of the chamber to the other one. Now instead of the ions moving, because they can't go through that membrane, what we're going to see move is going to be the actual just the water itself. And that's called osmosis. Um, so here you can see if you start out on one side with a higher ion content. With the same amount of water as the other side, and the moment we open up this, this, this semi permeable membrane, what's actually going to happen is the diffusion is like imagine it's almost like potential energy, but we really need to hold like each water can hold only a certain amount of salt. What's going to happen is because this side has more salt, technically it's able to absorb more water, so like the salt will attract the water. Because of that, water is going to get pulled from the right side into the left side, and you're going to see this. It's going to move the water from here to here until they reach equilibrium, right? So if you guys wanted to put numbers to this, we could say something like, here we have two molar of the salt. There's one molar, right? Because the ion can't move, the water's going to move that way until these two can reach equilibrium, right? That means that water is going to shift over down here until they have that molarity of like 1.5 or whatever. 
but until they balance each other out. Now, this is going to be important when we talk about the, uh, the next step, which is um, I want you to think about it now from the side of biology, right? From looking at thinking of how a cell works. So, in this case, we're going to be thinking about how the cell behaves relative to its environment, right? So, when we're describing it, we're looking at the amount of salts that you have on the inside of the cell versus the amount of salts that you find outside of the cell or its environment. In this case, the, the membrane right, can let water in and out pretty easily. Ions, potassium, sodium, are not going to move easily in and out of the cell. So that means that what's going to happen is depending on where the cell is, or sorry, depending on the ratio of the salt from inside the cell to outside the cell, that's where your water is going to travel. Right. If it's salty outside, your water is being. If your cell is salty in the environment, water is coming in. That make sense? All right. So at the extremes of this, um, in the environments where you have very high salt, all your water is going to basically rush out of the cells into the environment to try to reach the equilibrium. In that case, you're going to struggle up your cells. The other way is if you have a really high salt content on the inside of your cell, like that, your water is basically going to rush into that cell and you'll lice your cell. If you find a good balance, you have the right amount of salt or equal amount of salt on the outside and the inside, then you're not, you're, there won't be that big net movement of water. It'll still be coming in and out, but it's not, it's not going to have a driving force to create pressure. Yeah. Remember from our school, we used to do an experiment. We would get like cow blood, and then you guys had to set up different uh, osmolarity of, of the liquids. And basically, you guys were adding sugar to water until you can keep your red blood cells alive. So, in most cases, you would end up, I would give you water either here or here. I wouldn't tell you, and it was your job to try to figure out how to make it more concentrated. It didn't work. Uh, but yeah, so it's super important for, for basically for us. Yeah, good, okay. There we go. All right, so this is their little table trying to explain it, uh, basically what could happen. Um, so right now we've talked about this top part, and here I want you guys to be super, super, super comfortable with these top three words, hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic, right? So for this one, we're talking about hyper. It means it has high amounts of salts. Oh, sorry. Hypertonic environment, right? So I'm saying the environment itself is hypertonic, means that the environment has a lot of salt. If I say hypotonic environment, that means that I'm saying the environment has low salts, right? So hyper and hypo are the opposites. If it's isotonic, that means that the environment, when it's the cell, is going to be about equal amounts of salt concentration. Um, depending on how I apply that term, if I'm thinking about hypertonic cell versus hypertonic environment, it means the opposite. Yeah. So I feel comfortable with that. For mine and my notes, I kind of make my little table to look a little bit different than theirs. So I basically wrote the hyper. So, hypo. And for this, I want you guys to be thinking about the two different things, right? You have your environment, and you also have your cell. And then basically, what I want you guys to be thinking about here would be your salts, right? When it's ISO, like I said before, this means that they're equal. When you have hyper, not a, hyper, a hypertonic environment, that, that means that it's the one that's high in salts. And that means that the cell is relatively low. If I say hypo environment, uh, hypertonic environment, that means it's the opposite, right? You have no, no salts in the environment, but high salts in the cell. The result is what's going to happen with your water. Right? So here it's kind of like there's no net movement in the middle. In the case where you're hypertonic, you have high amounts of salt. On the outside, your water is going to follow that. That means your water is going to be going out of your cell. Um, 
Opposites of that is if your uh, hypotonic environment means it has very little salts, but your cell has so many salts, it's going to drive in the water. So it's going to move the water in, right? Sorry, I threw this in the wrong spot, but if you can imagine, I want you guys to add one more column right here, and I want you guys to put in what would happen to the cell, right? Hypotonic environment, you're driving in the water, you're likely to pop your cell. Hypertonic, that means your water is being driven out, you're going to shrivel up the cell. On this side, no change. Yeah. I'm going to use that for the homework and for the midterms to ask you guys questions about it. So, in order to, um, to deal with this, right, you have to kind of think about how these cells are going to deal with these environments that they're going to be facing, about whether you have high salt or low salt, and what are you going to do with water? For our cells, they have the plasma membrane. Which is remember, it's being held just by the interaction between the hydrophobic chains. In plant cells, um, the fact that they can't move, they've evolved to become a lot tougher, uh, tougher when dealing with water, either having low salts or high salts. And what really helps with them is going to be one, if they have a cell wall. So it's like this huge network of cells, oh, sorry, huge network of sugar molecules, long chains. It's like a little bit kind of like, um, they call it like a girdle, but. It's just wrapped around on the outside. And what that shell does is, in the times where you have a hypotonic environment, and you should be trying to drive in a lot of water, that big, having that big shell gives you the ability to not let that cell pop. You basically have like, you know, you've kept them inside of a little prison that doesn't like, protect the membrane. The other one is they have this big structure called a vacuole, where they can hold basically huge amounts of water, and they can actually actively contract that, or kind of like expand it. And that's also another way that they can uh, take water or they can control and try to squeeze it out of the cell. All right, so that's the big overall job that the, um, that's going to be happening with water. And now let's talk about um, what's going to happen with um, the movement of the salts, right? So remember again, salts are at the bottom of that table. They're the hardest things to move in and out through the membrane itself. And for this part, we're going to be talking about two different types. We have channel proteins, which is, like I said before, something like this. I want you in your head to think about straws. They don't change shape, but they're able to move the liquids in and out. The other ones we're going to be talking about are going to be these carrier proteins. The difference with this is that they're actually able to recognize the molecule. They bind to it on one layer and they can actually change conformation in order to release it into a different environment. Yeah. Uh, side note, some of these are very specific. The, one of my favorites is the uh, aquaporin. It's the one that transports water. The straw that it makes is so fine that you can only introduce one water molecule at a time. Like you can't have it interact with any other ion. It's literally just water moving right through it. And right now, since we're talking about, first we're going to talk about passive transport, which I want you guys to separate from active transport. So let's keep this in mind too. Passive versus your active. <clears throat> so we're now going to be talking about things on this side. For the passive side, the big notes here is that you're moving, you're moving down in concentration gradient. Okay. That means that when you're seeing this move, we're looking at things basically use the power of the fusion. Wherever you have high salts, let's say, hold on here, I'm going to draw this. This will be my cell. There's our membrane. Here we're in the cytosol. So we're on the inside. And here we're in the outer part. That's for a second. Here, if I ever bring these up, I'm going to ask a question. I expect you guys to kind of, uh, I'm assuming that you guys know this part. So it'll be when we're on the outside of the cell, here you're going to find high concentrations of sodium ions. 
means on the inside, you're going to, be, so you're going to find low amounts of sodium, right? And opposite to that, on the inside, this is where we normally find high levels of potassium. And then the other one is when it comes to charge, we normally have a negative charge on the, on the inside and a positive charge on the outside. All right. And if you guys feel comfortable with that, as I'm presenting to this, I'm gonna keep pointing to that to, to, to tell you guys what how things are working. But let me get back to this. So that means that when we're talking about passive diffusion, it would be like, since we have a lot of sodium ions on the outside, if we put a protein on the membrane that lets sodium move, sodium going from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell would be passive transport, right? It's going from high concentration to low concentration. Same thing if I put a potassium channel, put it on, put it onto that cell, and it lets the potassium come out of the cell. That basically be a passive movement because I don't need any energy. It can be removed just by the gradient itself. So for the passive, you still can have these two types: channel proteins and carrier proteins. Right. As long as there's a high concentration on one side, that channel will basically allow that molecule to move to the other side. Um, and same thing with carrier proteins, they can undergo the conformational change. But again, at this point, they're working as passive transport, which means that they can only move a molecule from high concentration to a low concentration. So this interaction for the passive ones, when they're doing this movement, like again, they're doing a conformational change. They basically grab onto the molecule, grab it where it's high concentration, They'll refold the protein, then they're allowed to put it into their side and dump it out. When they're doing that, they don't require any energy to be part of the mechanism. This is going to be a little bit different compared to the things I'm going to talk a little bit about later when I'm coming to uh, active transport. Um, I'm ready to end. So, I'm ready to no energy. So here's a little cartoon version of trying to show you the same thing. Channel protein um, is basically on the left. Some of them don't require a specific shape and they allow the molecule to go down. Some of these, um, they're called gated channels and they basically either use a, um, a second molecule or the concentration of first. Like in some cases, it'll be like these gates. It'll be like the actual port at the end. They don't open up until a molecule interacts at their base, which opens up the gates. Um, I think it's like one of them is like a pseudocodon as one of them would work based on that, but you don't need to know what it does. All right, and then the confirmation will change. They basically open and close one side to the other one. So it doesn't let the molecules just flow through. It literally has to like rock back and forth to grab one, dump it on the inside, grab another one, dump it on the inside, grab another one. All right. So again, so right now we've talked about passive transport. It's the test I get. Uh, yeah, you see, I might draw something like this, right? So here, I want you guys to think about the blue circles are basically trying to represent an ion. That black line, this, this vertical black line, is used to re represent a, uh, this is a fully permeable membrane, it means the ion, oh, sorry. Well, this is not a permeable membrane, which means things can't go through it. And then when I'm talking about the transport, because the ion is actually moving from left to right, here we have high ion concentration to low ion concentration. This is where I want you guys to think about that passive transport, right? It's moving down the gradient. Opposite to that would be something like this, which is if we have if the grids on the inside, let's say, and this is that arrow's driving the net movement towards the inside of the cell, that means you're opposing the gradient. So that means you're going to a form of active transport. So you have to kind of fight against diffusion. So active transport, the other two are this passive or, the, or where you're basically kind of working this in line with how diffusion would work. Now let's talk about the interesting ones, which is gonna be your active transport. In this case, the difference here is you're going up the gradient. So you're actually building up higher gradients of the molecules. The other part to this is it requires energy input. For this one, I'm going to be talking about one of them that has ATP. 
I'm also going to be talking about another one that uses uh, a second salt to power itself, which is pretty cool. So in this case, here they're showing you the molecule, right? It's moving from a place of low concentration to a place of high concentration. And this is what we're using, the actual ATP, the exact same one we use for our DNA. This high energy particle basically drops off. At this point, it's adenosine triphosphate, has all three phosphate groups. It'll bind only this molecule, it'll be bound on this side. The ATP comes in, the phosphorylation basically changes the conformation of the protein. That's where you do get energy of folding that protein in. Once on the inside, it'll release this molecule. Upon release of this molecule, it let the protein be set, and it'll kind of reset towards the outside to bring the wrap in there. But we're burning ATP in order to power this. And then because we're doing the that, that binding is based on the energy coming in. It's not just three flowing molecules through it. That's why they say that all active transporters are actually carrier proteins because they're carrying the molecule through. It's not like we can open up a channel, right? Because if you put a straw right through this, you'd expect for these ions to try to diffuse backwards. So active transport, it's always a carrier protein. So here we're going to be talking about yeah, one of my favorite ones from this side is going to be the proton pump, which is carries the H ions. So in this case, I think this was from bacteria. And what they basically do is they can move the hydrogen ions from inside the cell towards the outside of the cell, right? Um, again, you're grabbing the hydrogen molecule, pump it towards, towards the outside. You use your ATP to power the interaction and then to reset yourself to grab the next molecule. As you can imagine, this big movement of ions from inside to outside the cell, since you're only removing the positive ions, right? That means that you're going to end up building up a negative charge on the inside of that cell because you're releasing all that positive charge. Because that hydrogen had to come from an, right, an H2O that broke into an H, now OH. The moment you start getting rid of all these H's, the OH's are going to be left behind. Yeah. Here we go. All right, so right now, write in bold, because this is one of my favorite ones. Here's another example. This is the sodium potassium one. This one's super important. Um, so what it does is you're trying to get the movement of, you're trying to build up those molecules, right? High NA on the outside, <clears throat> high potassium on the inside. And you're trying to build up those molecules on the two different sides of the cell. This one's super important for eating food and for our brain function. And the way it does it is first, you can see here, super efficient. You can grab onto three sodium ions, right? So on the inside of the cell, where you should have low amounts of sodium, it'll grab the three sodiums, whatever it can find. It'll put them into the pocket. It uses the ATP to go that, that conformation will change. Here it'll drop, it'll throw to the higher concentration side, your sodium. This conformation will change, or the phosphate group helps the conformation will change. You'll then, on the place where you have the lowest amount of potassium, you grab the potassium, you bring two potassiums from the outside. Once the phosphate, uh, phosphate group releases, again, you redo a conformation will change, and you bring the potassium into the cell, right? So if you go back to my little drawing over here, right? What it's doing is it's grabbing sodium from this side, throws it over here where it should be at high concentration, grabs potassium from this side, comes it here where you have high potassium. Yeah. This thing's going to help us, it's going to do set up two things, or three things, right? At the end of this, because we're moving sodium and potassium in and out of the cell, you're going to enrich them into the two different environments. Right? So you're going to have high sodium outside, low potassium on the inside. The fact that it's a ratio of three to two also means you're kicking out three positives when you're only bringing back in two positives. That means that every time you do this reaction, you're building up more of a charge. So you're getting rid of positive charge, aka yourself. So you're becoming more negative on the inside. I think this is a video from the book. It basically does a bit of over the way it just kind of opens up grabs up to the inside, it kind of goes back and forth. Yeah, I rushed myself a little bit, so there. So 
the membrane itself or membrane potential is talking about basically that charge that we're talking is going to build up and it's going to be your um, electrochemical gradient, right? So here you're talking about your chemical gradient and we're talking about the ions. Again, building up the charge is going to be part of the, uh, sorry, that's the chemical, the electrical part of building that electrochemical gradient, at which point you basically have a lot of potential build up, right? The more sodium you have on the outside, that's a force that wants to get into the cell. The more potassium you have on the inside, that's another force that wants to get out. And then this is where cells actually have learned to take advantage of this, but I'm gonna go into that a little bit later. All right, so here we go. So here we're looking at the movement. First, you can look at it just at the molecules themselves, ignoring the charge it would be wherever you have high concentration of the molecule. It's like built up um, that gradient force, which the bigger the difference between the outside and the inside, the stronger it'll be that it, you want, it'll want to diffuse those molecules into that new space, or like the bigger the diffusive power. On top of that, if for example, on the left, if we have the same concentration difference, right? You have high amounts of this green molecule. If it's on the outside, if it's a positive charge, the strength of this diffusion becomes even stronger because now it's moving down its own concentration gradient. At the same time, it also has that charge that gives it that extra pull or push to go into the cell. If you did the opposite reaction and you had that molecule at high concentration on the inside trying to go out, at this point, you have the two forces fighting each other, right? Chemically, it wants to go out to help with the diffusion, but charge-wise, it wants to stay on the inside because it's in a negative environment and it's a positive charge. So here we're going to be talking about the two, the two pumps that I talked about: the proton pump, which is the ion, the H ions. Again, giving us a negative charge on the inside. Well, here we can look at the sodium potassium pump that we talked about right now, which does that three to two exchange. Again, building up a charge on the inside, a negative charge on the inside. Now this is the one where it gets super cool. Um, this is your, yeah, this is your H plus. So your H uh, hydrogen ion sucro, sucrose co-transporter. So for this case, what you're looking at here is that we're talking about this new co-transporter, right? That means that we're moving more than one molecule at a time. In this case, this one's called a symporter, which means that they're both moving together. So in this case, you have this proton pump, which is investing energy, right? ATP, that's what we build our DNA with, super important, but we're using it up to make this, this pump work. We build up a huge concentration of the hydrogen ions on the outside of the cell. The hydrogen ion now has two things that are gonna power it, right? Chemical, because there's a lot of hydrogen on the outside, it wants to come in. And the other one is electrical. It's a positive charge or negative on the inside. So the net force for this wants to rush into the cell, right? And then what we use is we have this, the co-transporter, which is we actually want to move the sugar molecule into our cells. So what's gonna happen here is you're gonna use the H ion, its driving force, and you're gonna use the sucrose as it's, as it, it's like co-transport, uh, the thing that's gonna get transported with it. But we'll use the energy of this to power this reaction. So basically both bind to, to different binding pockets on the outside of this protein. When they grab onto each other, you imagine the hydrogen ion, it's the one that's driving to making that protein fold to get itself in, but it's doing so, it's also folding to bring in the sugar. So you can actually drive sugar up its gradient. Right. So even if our cell on the inside had a lot of sugar, you can use the, the big driving force from the hydrogen ion to overcome that sugar force and push the sugar and hydrogen into the cell. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. There's also, um, so there, again, this one, that one was a, a sim porter. This is another case of a sim porter. Here we're, we're using, again, we're using our, our molecule that has a, a big buildup, right? High NA concentration on the outside. We use its charge to help push through this gradient. And that way, that way we can transport whatever molecule we need to, to come up with it, right? That, that thing will be able to grab into whatever we need to grab onto. And then we use that gradient of NA trying to push itself into the cell to help reshape that protein to bring in that other byproduct. So the thing is gonna carry along. Um, 
So in this case, symporters are when we're looking at the molecules being moved in the same direction, right? The sugar and the sodium were both on the outside and they got pushed inward. So like I said here, this, this I think, I don't like this drawing because it's not drawing the scale, but if you imagine <coughs> this green arrow, it's a lot stronger than this purple one. So by using the, the charge or the function of this one, we can actually drive the sugar into the cell. Same thing here with bringing in amino acids. The force of trying to bring in the sodium is so much stronger than the amino acid force trying to get out that it's going to bring in these molecules into the cell. The other type that we have is going to be antiporters, and that basically means that the molecules move in different directions. For this one, if I remember correctly, for this, there um, these two happen at the same time. It has to recognize both to be able to fold into itself and drop off its content. I believe these are sequential, so it'll be. Like imagine I was the protein, I, I grab onto the sodium on the outside. When it grabs it, right, it wants to bring it into the cell that gives you the driving force. You get to reconformational change. It'll open up the other pocket. Now it'll be on the inside of the cell and it'll be receptive to the second molecule. Here it'll be calcium, it grabs into the calcium. That causes then the conformational change and it brings it back out. So you, one molecule goes in, the other one comes out. But you use the force of one to help reset that protein to bring the, the molecules in and out of the cell. So the difference is, like I said, here, the sodium ends up on the inside. The molecule we care about is the one that's getting kicked out. So it's going in the opposite direction. All right, so here, I would say probably build a table of the things that we've been talking about. Channels, carriers, you have your pumps, and you have the antiporters and symporters. Those are the things that I'll be asking you for like midterms and for the homeworks. Um, in your discussion of this, I want you guys to feel comfortable with you need to explain to me how the ions are behaving. So in your answers, I better be hearing hypertonic environment, isotonic environment, or hypertonic environment, right? Tell me how the environment is behaving relative to that cell. Then you can use when I have to use these molecules, I want you to explain to me if is the molecule moving down its gradient or is it moving up its gradient, right? Are you using passive reactive transport? I want you to tell me if you're using, in this case, if you use ATP. And here, if you're using a second molecule to have, kind of help function moving against the gradient, yeah? If not, write it on your card, which you want to go over again, and then I'll go over it next week. But be comfortable with this. I would almost build this into a table where you guys should write your notes about how these molecules are moving. What's the force that's driving it? Is it itself? Is it a second molecule? Is it the charge of the cell, of the cell itself? And then um, give me a good idea of how the environment is behaving. All right. This one I'm going to go over just a little bit quickly because we only have a few minutes left. But for the bulk transport, it's about moving big things. For this one, I want you guys to think about, feel comfortable with these two words here. So phagocytosis, hemocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. So phagocytosis, you guys have talked about this before, right? That's something like this, where you um, deform your membrane, you wrap around the molecule you want to absorb, and then you basically close off around the back and you end up making a vacuum. Right? So you can capture a big, a big molecule or a big complex of molecules. It's a little messy because it's going to grab multiple things and you might get more than what you're trying to actually trying to grab. Right? Uh, for pinocytosis, it's more like uh, the uptake of sugar and protein. So these are smaller particles, right? but it's the same method. You basically build your plasma membrane around it, engulf it, bring it into your cells. And then uh, for some of these, you can absorb it or you can have transporters move molecules in and out into your cells. Again, still a little bit messy. This one, the receptor mediated endocytosis, this is neater and it's a lot more specific. So in this case, the big thing that you're gonna have is you're gonna have receptors on your surface that are basically kind of like magic little hands trying to hold on to the molecule you care about. It's gonna grab onto as many copies of that as you can. You're gonna enrich it in the area, then you're gonna engulf that area. And by doing so, you're going to bring in that specific article that you care about. Yeah. All right. So watch the videos from the book. I need your questions from today. And uh, I'll leave you this homework on Friday. And drive homework. Go to one of your professors on Friday. We'll say hello to you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Right. Go say hello. Go to the next one. Thank you.